All right, welcome to the second half of the fourth lecture. I think I titled this lecture Closure, but that was, uh, the real title is The Relationship uh, Between Uh, uh, the regular and uh, context free uh, languages. So recall last when we proved the relationship between automata last time, we proved that uh, LDFA is the class of languages decided by uh, DFA, we proved that this was actually equivalent to LNFA. We have to do a double set containment in the power construction and the power set construction. Uh, well, then we proved that this was also equal to L uh, regular expression, and that that this th that these three things are the same class, just by a different name. Every DFA has an NFA and a regular expression, and so on. Every regular language has an, has one, uh, a DFA, NFA, or regular expression. In fact, there, in fact, there's also the GNFAs that we kind of briefly mentioned. Um, However, the, the regular, the context-free grammars look to be different. So these are, these are the regular languages. We let uh, L a CFG is equal to the, um, uh, we'll call these context-free uh, languages. So it is the languages which have a context-free grammar uh, to produce them. So uh, L is an LCFG. Uh, then uh, there exists a, a CFG uh, to produce uh, L. Here again, there's a distinction between automata and grammars. Gram uh, automata say yes or no. They decide. So the automata decide the language. Grammars produce the language. So here the CFG must produce the language. It doesn't decide the language, it produces it. Um, we noted that like uh, A star is both uh, regular. and uh, context-free. So A star is a language which is both, which is regular, and it's a language which is context-free. It's regular because that's the regular expression for it. I literally wrote it as a regular expression. It's context-free because we gave grammar for it. It's the first grammar we gave. So this is a language which is regular and context-free. So the regular languages and context-free grammars at least overlap in some sense. Um, but we gave like a to the n, b to the n, is not regular. Recall that we had to use the pumping lemma to prove that this language was not regular. Uh, this language is not regular, uh, but we gave a grammar for it, but was uh, context-free. So it seems that these are not different. We're not going to be able to show that the um, CFGs are equivalent to the regular languages because they're somehow, uh, they're, there's at least one language which is context-free which could not, could not be regular. So what we're going to prove is actually uh, that every regular language um, is context-free, strictly. What that really means is that uh, if there is a regular expression for a language or an NFA or DFA, then there also exists a context-free grammar for it. But it's not true that, this, that the reverse inclusion could exist or is provable because there is, certainly exist languages which we have demonstrated are context-free, which are not uh, regular. So the picture is going to look like this is what we mean. So this is going to be L uh, NFA. 
or L DFA or L Rex. These are all the same. And that this context free languages are a superset of um, the regular languages. So here, for example, in this Venn diagram, maybe it's A star. And then like here, we have like, like A to the N, B to the N. Here we have like W, W, R, the even palindromes, and so on, right? So there's several examples you can come up with, languages which are context-free but not regular. Um, right. The reason why it's important to prove this, even though maybe you have some intuition about, okay, we have something strictly stronger, because if we didn't prove it, it could be the case that our Venn diagram maybe looks something like that, right? Somehow maybe there is, if we didn't prove every, we proved some languages are context-free and not regular, and we proved some languages are regular and context-free, we wouldn't know if there's a language which is regular but not context-free. Turns out these don't exist. Every language which is context-free, excuse me, every language which is regular must also be uh, context-free. So uh, before we get into this, let's talk about uh, some proofs using closure, um, using uh, uh, the regular languages. So we proved, uh, last time what? We proved uh, that uh, the regular languages are closed uh, under a union concatenation uh, star. We briefly said why they were, those are the three regular expression operations, so that's why they're closed under that one. They're also closed under complement, which we mentioned that if you flip the accept and reject states of a DFA, you will decide the opposite language. So they're also closed under complement. And on the first day, we technically proved that they were closed under intersection, but we, can, we didn't really know what we were saying then. We just gave a Cartesian product construction to give a DFA for the intersection of two DFAs. The DFA simulated two other DFAs and ran both at the same time and only accepted if both of them accepted. So that's the intersection. But we can actually do a proof of that uh, the regular languages are closed under, under intersection by doing De Morgan's law. So it should be obvious, but I'm going to write out the proof to be very verbose. Uh, let li, lj be uh, regular languages. So any two regular language languages uh, by closure. L i bar, L j bar, are regular. So if L i and L j are regular languages, so are L i complement and L j complement. The complement of a regular language is also regular. But then, so is L i bar union L j bar. If L i bar is regular, L j bar is regular then the union of two regular languages is also regular. Because we proved that the regular languages are closed under union. So li bar union lj bar is regular. But then so is li bar union. I'll write it a little bigger. li bar union lj bar bar. So the complement of the union of the complement of Li and the complement of Lj. By De Morgan's law, this is just, uh, but this equals Li intersect Lj, right? By De Morgan's law. So the intersection of any two regular languages is regular.
right? Again, I'm being very, very verbose with the proof, but the idea is like you could just quickly say Li, if, if, if it's closed under complement and union, this is just complements and union. So this is just intersection, and therefore it's closed under intersection. You could be quick about it if you want. Um, so the regular languages we know are closed under union, concatenation, star, complement, and now uh, intersection. But you can actually use closure to prove certain languages are not regular. So recall that the Dick language is equal to valid balance parentheses. Uh, so we gave the grammar for this language as what? It was S goes to open S close or SS or epsilon, right? So the language is context-free, because we can give a context-free grammar for it. So we know that it is in, um, <coughs> we know that uh, uh, this is uh, in LCFG. We prove uh, that, that this language is also uh, not uh, regular. And we could do pumping for this one, but the de the, what I want to demonstrate is that you can sometimes quickly use enclosure, show a language is non-regular by using um, closure, quicker, quicker than pumping. So like assume to the contrary, that the Dick language is regular. Note that open parentheses star, close parentheses star, is also regular. So don't get confused here that I'm using the alphabet to be open and close parentheses. That's just a letter, any other letter. And I'm putting it to the star. So any number of opens followed by any number of closes, right? What is the Dick language? intersect uh, open star, close star. Just open star, close star. Is it? You're saying this is a subset of this, if that would be true. But I say that there are strings in here which are not in here. Oh, yeah, of course, right. If you have more than. To the end? Is that open? Yeah. Which is yes. the same as. So what's it? Say it out loud. Is that the non-regular language that we went over, like H? Yeah. So H this just to just to complete it, this is open to the end, close to the end. This is exactly the um, the strings that are in both of these. The intersection is going to be both. The strings that are in both are exactly going to be the ones where the number of opens equals the number of closes. Here, this forces the structure that the opens all have to come before the closes, so you can't do anything complicated anyway. But the only thing that you can enforce to be in the intersection has to be that the number is equal. But this is non-regular, right? So uh, the idea is, since uh, the Dick language and uh, open star, uh, open, uh, open star, close star are both regular, Uh, and uh, regular languages are closed under intersection. We just proved that. The intersection should be regular. But we observe it's just a to the n, b to the n, our canonical non-regular language. 
contradiction. So if the regular languages are closed under intersection, like we know they are, then we should be able to take the intersection of two regular languages and get a regular language back. However, we take the intersection of the Dick language with another regular language. We didn't get a regular language back. We got a non-regular language. So we know that the Dick language, uh, so the Dick language is not regular. So didn't even have to use pumping. Just use some simple facts about closure. Uh, we know that the Dick language is not regular. We were able to give a grammar for it, so we know that it is at least context-free, right? So, um, right. Let me give you one more quick example. Oh my god! It's going to turn on when I. Oh my god! Okay. Let me give you. Uh, this was on the, the exam actually in spring semester uh, to prove this language is not regular. So L. Mu in sigma star uh, W is not a palindrome. So this was a, this was I thought an easy problem I gave on the first exam when I taught this class in spring, and I thought this is so easy. This is, everyone's going to get this. Most people miss this problem. Turns out so. Uh, the idea is that, like, well, let me give you guys a minute to think about it, and then I'll tell you the answer. Yes? Can you just say, we know that palindromes are not regular, so they're complement. Um, assume this is regular. Its complement has to be regular. Its complement is the palindromes, which is not regular. Perfect. Exactly. So, like, the idea is easy, but explaining it in English is actually, s there's a slight mess there. People give all kinds of crazy arguments. Anything that isn't not a palindrome is a palindrome. That's it. So just to write your proof and be clear about it, assume to the contrary. Um, L is regular. Then so is L bar, L complement. But that's just palindromes. Anything that isn't not a palindrome is a palindrome. So anything not an L must be a palindrome, right? Because L contains strings that are not palindromes. So a contradiction, right? Another thing this demonstrates is that since the regular languages are closed under complement, the non-regular languages are also closed under complement. Just, you can think of closure as you being in a closed system. You're like in the bubble. You're in the bubble, you stay in the bubble. You're out the bubble, you stay out the bubble. You don't cross into and out of the bubble under those operations, right? Like, this is every language. Something. This is just regular. So if you hear the compliments are always going to be here, if you hear the compliments are always going to be here. There's no mixing with respect to specific operations. Maybe they're not closed under other operations, who knows? But for the, for the complement, at least, you stay, in your, you stay in your lane. You're not regular. If you're regular and you stay in your lane, you're not regular. You also stay in your lane. So for the same reason that the regular languages are closed under complement, uh, the non-regular languages are also closed under complement. Okay? Now let's prove the main point of today, that every, um, every regular language is also context-free. So um, there's like two good proofs of this. I'm going to explain the hard bad proof and then just 
explain the easier, cooler proof. So we say, we say we, we, we talked about context-free grammars, but there's a restriction of context-free grammars called regular grammars. They have the same parts. They have a V, they have a sigma, they have a set of productions, and they have a start non-terminal. But the difference is that the, for the productions, uh, every rule has to have the form V goes to uh, sigma V, or uh, I'll, I can even do the bar, or sigma here. So basically what that means is while you can only have rules like that, that look like this. So you go to a, there's exactly one non-terminal and exactly one terminal. And the terminal comes before the non-terminal, always. Meanwhile, so this is for the regular grammars. For the, in, in, for the context-free, free grammars, we had rules of the form V goes to uh, V union sigma star, right? So basically, any string over the terminals and non-terminals. Any combination of crazy things you can do here, you can know that's allowed to be a rule for a CFG, as long as there's one non-terminal on the left. You have to, both of them have one non-terminal left, but this one has any number, any string, terminals and non-terminal on the right. This one is forced to have, or I guess it should be also the epsilon. But this is forced to have rules that look very specific. They look like a very specific thing. It turns out that the regular grammars correspond exactly to the regular languages. That if a language is regular, it also has a regular grammar. So it not only has a regular expression, an NFA and a DFA, a generalized NFA, uh, it also has a regular grammar. So the grammar of an NFA has to, a grammar of a regular language looks like this. Now, every regular grammar clearly is a context-free grammar for the same reason every DFA is an NFA. The definition of a context-free grammar is simply a generalization. So if we could prove that every regular, that the regular grammars correspond to the regular languages, we would have concluded then, just by this, the thing we get for free, that every regular language is context-free. That would complete the proof for us. But that proof is hard. So I'm going to just kind of outline it, just high, high level. Like a for a DFA, um, Let's say D is equal to Q uh, sigma Q0 transition function and F. Uh, build a regular grammar uh, V sigma P and S. So, like, uh, if Q is equal to Q0 to QK, then uh, B is going to be equal to capitals Q0, QK. So add one non-terminal per state of your um, DFA. Like, uh, and then sigma is just going to be the sig sigma. The productions, of course, like the DFA, the transition function is what's interesting. In a grammar, the productions are what's interesting. So like if you have transition of the form like QI, so you read an A, and you go to QJ, then you add production. And this, by the way, as in function notation, would be like delta QI comma A equal to QJ. Right? Then you add production uh, like QI goes to a q j right and then like uh, like if uh, q f is a final state uh, you add productions like capital q f goes to the empty string so the high level idea of the proof is actually simple and great but the actual proof of correctness is quite involved so I'm just going to give you the high level, the spirit of it, the proof here. Basically, consider the computation here. Oh, what's the start symbol, by the way? I'll just put it here. S is equal to Q0. Right? 
your computation in the grammar is going to begin at Q0, capital Q0. It's going to go through a sequence of states adding one letter, at most one letter each time. And it's, not, it's going to put them in order. So what happens here is your working string is always going to have exactly and only one non-terminal. And that non-terminal is going to have its own set of productions. So this grammar non-deterministically produces exactly the paths in the DFA. And then it only accepts the paths which end on a final state. Why? Because we stop the computation when we reach a final state. Doesn't say, there may be another loop back somewhere, and that's fine to take. But we can only stop the computation if the last state is going to be a final state. Right? So like if we consider the DFA that looks like this, something really <coughs> trivial. Let's say this was Q0, and it is a final state, and has an A transition. Right? Let's say this is what was our, our, our DFA, just to be ridiculously simple. Our set of grammars um, would look like what? It's going to be like uh, Q0. We'll say like S goes to Q0. Uh, Q0 is going to go to AQ0. And then Q0 is also a final state. So Q0 is going to go to epsilon. Right? So if you consider productions of this grammar, you're going to go to Q0. Q0 is just basically just going to keep adding A's in the front. And then it's just going to accept. Right? So this grammar is actually going to accept A star, which is exactly what that DFA produces. Right? So if you imagine, the restriction here is like too strong. Right? So like context two grammars can do all these things. This restricted form eliminates a lot of that power. Because for like, when we had A goes to ASB, this was able to produce A to the N, B to the N, which was not regular, right? But that really required using both sides of the non-terminal. Here, we're only using one side of it. So you use one side of the non-terminal, it's too weak. You can't really do as much as you can. And in fact, you can only do exactly uh, the power of the regular languages with this way. The problem with proving correctness of this is it's a little too strong. So like there's four parts to the proof, and it's really boring and mechanical. So I'm just going to highlight the proof and then give a much easier one. So what, what you do for this one is you like uh, for uh, regular grammar G, uh, give uh, NFA N, approve a double set containment, prove a double, So I prove that uh, L of G is a subset of L of N, and that L of N is a subset of L of G. Uh, for uh, NFA N, uh, you give a regular grammar G, and then you prove the same thing twice. So like, to prove that the regular languages correspond exactly as well to the regular grammars, there's like four parts to this. And the simulate is like four repeated parts. So like, given the grammar, produce the NFA. Given the, and that's mechanical. You have to prove a double set containment. So that's exactly the right strings. Then for the NFA, give the regular grammar, which is basically what we did, the highlights of it, the important part. Then you have to do double set containment that way. It's four mechanical parts. It's kind of annoying. Uh, it's not very informative either. So. It's just really a lot of busy work on this one. But, and I was like, wow, so there's a, so the only other way I knew previously to prove the regular languages uh, were context free requires something from like two lectures next. It's not harder, it's just it requires more info. But then I woke up one morning, I was like, wait a minute, there's, got, I, I, there's a much easier way to prove that regular languages are all context free. And it corresponds to a very, very simple idea. So when we do any proof with the regular languages, I'm choosing NFAs or DFAs or whatever based on simplicity. Like whatever I want to be, whatever restricted form I want to make the proof simpler, I get to, I get to do. So sometimes that means choosing NFAs so I get the freedom to, to prove things. Sometimes that means choosing DFAs because the restriction makes the proof simpler. To prove every regular language is context free, that means I could just choose a simpler one. I don't need to go from a complicated structure to a complicated structure. I'm going to go from the regular expressions. 
So we're going to prove, actually, to prove that every regular language is context-free, we're going to prove uh, that every regular expression corresponds to a context-free grammar. Now that seems much easier than thinking about the structure of a DFA or an NFA. Part of the problem with this is that DFAs and NFAs are deciders. They're automata. They say yes and no. Grammars non-deterministically prove something. A regular expression is much closer to a grammar than, a D, than an automata is because it, the thing somehow non-deterministically produces strings as well. It's not really a grammar, but it is kind of like a grammar. So in fact, we can prove that every regular expression is context-free the same way we prove that every regular expression has an NFA. We can proceed by induction. So this is, a, uh, I think, a really cute proof by induction. Uh, so recall that a regular expression, first of all, I guess I should give the definition of a regular expression. It's one of six things. It's the empty set, it's the empty string, the set containing the empty string, uh, or the alphabet, the sets containing the singleton elements. And it's closed, uh, or it's like the ri union rj, ri rj, and ri star. Right? So you atomically build up these pieces, and then you combine them using union concatenations and stars. And then that's a regular expression. So all we need to do is but to prove that every regular expression is context-free by induction is give the base cases and then just prove that the context-free languages are closed under union, concatenation, and star. And that's easier than it sounds, actually. So uh, what are the base cases? What is a, what is a grammar uh, for the empty set? We just did this one, actually. So just like S to S. Yeah. So by exhibiting a context-free grammar, we have proven the language is context-free. What about the empty string? Is it just S to empty string? Yeah. So that one's easy. OK, what about A and B? I, it's almost embarrassing to ask, but I mean. S to A. S yeah, OK. Just got to make sure we're awake, you know? Okay, so cool, we've done the base cases. So base cases. Uh, let uh, L I L J be context free. It will be, let them be regular. Languages with context free uh, grammars uh, G I uh, G J with start variables, start non terminals uh, S I S J respectively. Let's give a context-free grammar for the union of Li and Lj. So uh, why is Li union Lj uh, context-free? See if we can get this one. Give me a context-free grammar for the union of Li and Lj. Given that we know inductively, by the induction hypothesis, Gi and Gj exist. They're context-free grammars for those two regular languages. So given that those two exist, uh, how do we know that there exists a context-free grammar for Li union Lj? Once you get one of these, by the way, they all follow easily. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, 
new start uh, non-terminal. And uh, the production, S is the new start non-terminal. It's going to go to SI or SJ. So SI is the start non-terminal for all of L of I. So given SI, it non-deterministically produces all of L of I. SJ non-deterministically produces all of, SJ, of LJ. So SI or SJ is going to non-deterministically produce. All these are going to produce all of LI. All of this is going to produce all of LJ. This has to produce then all of LI union SJ, LJ because it produces everything in LI and everything in LJ. So we added a new start non-terminal to produce both. So given now we know that one, can we do Li concatenated with Lj? Would it just be the same thing, but concatenation? Yeah, exactly. Add a new start non-terminal, and then concatenate the two start non-terminals. Why? This is, so anything in Li and Lj is going to have a prefix in Li and like the postfix in Lj. This is going to generate the prefix independently, by the way, of anything Sj does. Right? So these two things are going to do whatever separately, and then you just concatenate them. So that is technically going to produce all of, um, every, it's going to produce the concatenation. So now what about the star? Doesn't it just produce two of them? Two of them. It, this should produce, wait, this one? Yeah, so it'd be like SI transitions to SI, SI. Ah, so... That is a gotcha, and I've fallen for this trap as well. I think it might be in the notes. This is an error for the same reason that we had to add a new state when we did the DFA. The NFAs were closed under star. We have to add a new thing. So it's actually S goes to S, SI, and we don't know that SI produces the empty string or not, so we have to produce it. That looks too diagonal, right? So again, I could write it all out. You know, let li, lj be regular languages, and then by the induction hypothesis, uh, grammar's gi. Oh my god! When I walk over here, it's gonna. <sighs> by the induction hypothesis, gi and gj exist. I should be a little more rigorous, like they exist of depth or something, right? Indexing on the number of applications of the thing or whatever. But this is sufficient, right? So we, if they're closed well, under union concatenation and star, so that uh, therefore every regular uh, expression is produced by context-free grammar, and every regular expression produces a regular language. So therefore, we can conclude that. Um, the regular languages are uh, context-free. So now we know that the context-free languages are strictly more powerful than the regular languages and not just different and weird. That they are a superset and they are special. OK? Let's talk about closure. Any questions on this proof before we, before we get on to the next part? We all got the, got the parts. Um, It turns out that the context-free languages are not closed under, we proved the context-free languages are closed under uh, union, concatenation, and star. It turns out that the context-free languages are not closed under intersection or complement. By the way, just in any general space, like anything, like a, a class, and if it's closed under union and closed under complement, we got the intersection for free, right? So intersection and complement are related in that way. If you are closed under intersection, not even for like languages, for just general sets, anything, if you're closed under intersection and complement, 
you can get the union for free. You can get closure under union for free, right? So these are all not independent. These are like all related, right? So the fact that you don't get intersection is part of the reason you don't get complement and so on, right? So it's enough for me to prove that the regular language, excuse me, the context-free languages are not closed under complement. So uh, some, some foreshadowing here. L to the A to the N, B to the N, uh, C to the N, uh, N is a number. So this has three, tri is a triple, is not context-free. We haven't proven this yet, but we will eventually. But for now, for this proof, we can assume it's not context-free. Okay? It should be very different than A to the N. Well, let's first think about why it's not context-free. So like A to the N, B to the N was context-free because you can put the A's and the B's. And you keep track of the A's and the B's. Somehow you have to be able to put, keep track of the A's and the B's and the C's. That's impossible, it turns out, for a context-free drug. Grammar, context, so like in the sense like a DFA has no memory, it's like a, uh, a context-free grammar. It doesn't help you have to think of it like an automaton, but it's closer to a goldfish because it can memorize like one thing at a time. It can keep track of the A's and the B's, but then it, when it has, has to start working on the C's, it forgets what it's doing. Yes? What would be like the complement? Of a context free grammar. Like, As a set, the set of strings which are not in that grammar, not in that language. So the complement of this language, for example, would be you could just say any string that's not of the form a to the n, b to the n, c to the n, without having to write it out explicitly. Right? I claim there is no grammar, uh, there is no uh, CFG for this language. Right? Um, that doesn't mean there's related CFG. So like a to the n, c B star, C to the N would, all, would certainly be context free. You could build a grammar for that one. Keep track of A to the N and B to the N, and then when you're done, just insert as many Bs as you want. Just insert a bunch of free Bs. The problem arises when you need to insert exactly the number of Bs as A to the N and B to the N, right? So that's, that's where the trouble comes from. And we're going to use some idea of this in our proof. So uh, note, uh, like A star, a B to the N, a C to the N is uh, a CFL. It's a context-free language. Why? You can build a grammar for this one. S goes to A, S, or I'll do capital A just to separate things so I don't get confused. Capital A, and then we'll go to R, and then A is going to go to A, A, or epsilon. So A is going to produce A star here. R is going to produce B to the N, C to the N. So that's going to be like R goes to A, nope, B, R, C, or epsilon. And that should be A star B to the N, C to the N. Uh, also note, for the similar reason, uh, A to the N, B to the N, C star uh, is a CFL. Why? Well, we can do the same grammar. We'll do A goes to R, C. C goes to little c, big C, or epsilon. R goes to A, R, B, or epsilon, right? So we agree that both of these languages are CFLs. Um, but what is, what is uh, A star, uh, B to the N, C to the N, intersect... with A to the N, a B to the N, a C star. Give a second for this one to marinate. Isn't it just A to the N, B to the N, C to the N? Yeah. This one enforces the number of A's equals the number of B's. This one enforces the number of A's, B's equals the number of C's. By transitivity, this could only equal uh, A to the N, B to the N, C to the N. We mentioned but did not prove that this language is regular, excuse me, is not context-free. So a context-free language gave a grammar for it. Context-free language gave a grammar for it. The intersection of these two context-free languages is not context-free. So we have gone outside the bubble, essentially. Uh, Therefore, the CFLs are not closed under complement, and they're not closed under intersection. Let's see. 
Any more questions? Awesome.